Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe, and it's just me here today. Some scheduling conflicts over the last few weeks have made recording kind of difficult for us. So in order to get ourselves back on track, I've got a non-standard episode for you today. Uh, Way back almost two years ago, we released a bonus episode on the main podcast feed that was... Uh, It was me reading a short story that had been making the rounds in various uh, D&D forums. It was titled The Ballad of Garg and Moonslicer. It was a short story with sound effects, music, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I've had a lot of people over the years tell me that they wish we would do more episodes like this. So here we are. Uh, So this episode is going to be another short story, but this time it is actually one that is written by yours truly. It was written by me. This is one of the short stories that is currently up on our Patreon. If you go to uh, patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. Um, and it's one that I feel very strongly about. More on that at the end of the episode. Uh, not only do I want more people to be able to enjoy my writing and possibly become Patreon backers as a result, but I also just really like this story. Um, I don't want to bog this down with plugs and admin and all that. So let me just quickly direct everyone to go check out the other podcasts on the Crit Nation Fellowship. There's Crit Academy, D&D Character Lab, and Brute Force and Ignorance. You can find all those at critnation.com. And if you like this story, you can find more stories of similar quality by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. Also, uh, one last thing. I'm going to be uploading a story-only version of this episode with just the story and none of the spiel at the beginning or the end, uh, as well as on our blog, interpartyconflict.com. There uh, should be a link to our SoundCloud, which is where they'll all be. It's not going to be in the main feed, though, so you'll have to go and seek it out yourself if you want to be able to listen to just the story. But uh, you can find those at those at those places, so YouTube and interpartyconflict.com. So without further ado, I present today's story, The Dinner Date. <laughs> The martial artist kept tight grip on his bow staff. It was the only thing keeping the dragon's jaws from crushing him, but if he let go, he wouldn't survive the fall. The mages told him it was made of unbreakable wood, and he was putting it to the test. Letting out a frustrated roar, the huge scaled beast jabbed a claw at the man, eager to remove that pest from its mouth. Still holding onto the protruding staff, the warrior leapt and thrust his feet at the oncoming talon, deftly knocking it aside and prompting another angered roar from the dragon. This time, however, the mighty behemoth began a massive intake of breath. The warrior knew that could only mean one thing, and it wasn't good. Bracing one foot against a gigantic fang, the man kicked off as hard as he could, yanking the staff out from where it had been embedded in the top and bottom of the dragon's mouth. Just as he leapt out of the toothy maw, the back of the beast's throat illuminated, and fire was bursting out, threatening to burn the man to a crisp. So in midair, he twisted his body, swinging the staff with all the momentum of his spin, striking a tooth hard and knocking the dragon's head aside, causing the blast of flame to shoot off into the sky. The tooth, knocked loose, flew off and landed in the canyon below. Having escaped from the dragon's mouth in the nick of time, the warrior found himself falling fast. Luckily, he heard a familiar voice shout his name. Jorg, catch! In that instant, a grappling hook rocketed past his face, and with cat-like reflexes he grabbed hold, stopping his fall and causing him to swing in an arc away from the dragon and towards a cliff face nearby. Holding the rope with one hand, he used the other to stow his staff on his back and then climbed up as fast as he could. At the top greeted him the face he expected, his close friend, the curly-haired paladin Cathalin. She helped him up onto a ledge where she had been hiding behind a boulder, and down below the dragon thrashed in pain, trying to regain its bearings after having been struck so hard in the face. I have an idea, Kathleen began, reaching into her pack and rummaging for supplies. If we can lure the dragon out of the canyon... I've got a quicker one, interrupted Jorg, pulling out the unbreakable staff and wedging it under the nearby boulder. Push down on this end with all your strength. Kathleen tossed her bag aside and gripped the staff as instructed. While she used it as a lever, 
Jorg got under the boulder and pressed his shoulder against it as firmly as he could. On three, he said, the two companions locking eyes. He counted in rhythm, and with a nod, they caused the boulder to dislodge from the cliff, just in time for the dragon to notice and send a breath of fire up towards them. But unluckily for the great beast, the rock fell and crushed it beneath. Jorg and Kathleen smiled at one another, taking the moment before continuing on their quest. So you killed a dragon, said the young man, a passenger on a caravan through the countryside. Across from him sat an unassuming gentleman with a graying beard and ordinary traveling clothes, idly petting a large ginger dog that was quietly snoring at its owner's feet. You make it sound easy. The older man laughed and shrugged. I didn't say it was easy, but we did it, and we didn't die, so take that as you will. He began running his hands along his pockets, but didn't find what he was looking for. I managed to recover the tooth I knocked loose, lying on the ground afterwards. People told me it might be valuable, but I liked it as a keepsake. Hmm. I seem to have misplaced it. It's probably in my bag. The younger man rolled his eyes, but it went unnoticed. Uh Uh-huh, he replied. Sure. So, uh, what brings you out here? More dragons to slay? The older man shook his head. No, nothing like that. I'm much too old now. I'm visiting my wife. I've been away far too long, and today is her birthday. Hopefully I can make it to her before sunset. As he spoke, there was the faintest twinkle in his eye. The younger passenger turned his posture slightly as to face away from the older man and did not inquire further. After some time, however, with nothing to occupy the mind except counting the bumps in the road, he turned back and spoke. Jorg, was it? Jorg nodded. And your name? Geddert, said the young man. And does the dog have... Jorg nodded. This is Yasmin, he said, patting the canine on the side and receiving a murmur of comfort in response. She doesn't usually travel with me, but I figured the occasion... A moment passed. Geddert spoke up again. How long have you been married? Jorg looked up at the wagon's canvas roof while he thought and then replied, About forty years. Forty-two, to be specific. Geddert nodded. Taking a deep breath and figuring he would likely regret it, he asked, Do you have any other tales you'd like to share? It's a fairly dull ride we're on. The older man scratched the side of his chin and then nodded. Have you ever heard of a sorcerer by the name of Luxgrave? Geddert shook his head. Must have been before your time, said Jorg. Let's see, it was about forty years ago, and Luxgrave had a castle up in the hills. Off in the distance, Castle Luxgrave shined in the afternoon sun, its many spires plated in gold and silver, examples of the wealth and power of its owner, daring thieves and vandals to try to take what was on display. As it stood, a bastion in the green and brown northern hills, an army approached. Dozens of steeds ran at full speed, their riders fully clad and armed, banners and horns making their approach known to all. Stealth was far less important than speed, and heading the army were two light war horses, one in the front mounted by a young bearded man, his unbreakable staff strapped to his back his eyes locked on the glistening castle before him. Just beside him, however, was a man wearing a majestic golden crown and armor of the finest filigree. Jorg! shouted the crowned man as the castle came into view. It appears we still have time. What plan do you propose? Jorg squinted, recognizing the layout of the castle from the description given to them by the seer who had divined Luxgrave's plans. My king, he shouted back, maintaining top speed. I believe the ceremony is taking place in the cathedral. He pointed towards the tallest structure on the castle grounds, adjacent to the central courtyard. We have enough men to fight our way in. I would gladly give my life if it meant bringing the dark ritual to an end. The king nodded with a tiny smirk. Don't go giving your life fruitlessly. Remember, someone else is counting on you too. Jorg did not respond, though his resolve was clear. They both spurred on their horses. There was no time to lose. All of the king's men reached the castle as quickly as possible, but surprisingly, the gate was left open. 
Jorg weighed the potential dangers, but time was of the essence. He gestured for the rest of the army to follow him, and every knight shouted an affirmation as they rode with Jorg and their king into the open courtyard. As soon as they passed the gate, Jorg yanked on the reins and his steed slid to a halt, followed by all of the other knights that could fit. They were surrounded on all sides by vicious orc warriors wielding bloody weapons and wearing rusty armor, all licking their lips in anticipation of the coming battle. And standing in front of the main castle entrance, wearing the full heraldry of his master, was the tallest and most brutish-looking hyena-faced knoll Jorg had ever seen. The brute stepped forward, a wicked halberd in its hand and a grin on its furred face. Lord Luxgrave is not taking visitors, it said, drool frothing from its lips. Jorg leapt from his horse, closing half the distance between himself and the knoll on foot. Today he'll have to make an exception, he said, drawing his unbreakable staff. Every single orc warrior drew their weapons and got into a ready stance, but their leader held up a hand to stop them. Today is a very special day, continued the knoll, its grin getting wider. I am under strict instruction not to let anyone interrupt Lord Luxgrave on today. His wedding day. Jorg gritted his teeth and his hands might have snapped his staff in two if the king hadn't dismounted and placed a hand on his shoulder. Blasphemy, replied the king. Kidnapping a maiden and sacrificing her to the gods of darkness makes not a wedding. Taking a deep breath, Jorg spoke quietly. My liege, are the men at the ready? The king patted him on the shoulder in response. Of course, do what you think is best. Jorg called out to the giant brute. I'll make you a deal. The knoll raised an eyebrow and did not interrupt. You and me, one on one. If I defeat you, you step aside and let me, and me alone, through the door. If you defeat me, our entire army shall leave you to your dark misdeeds. The knoll appeared to think it over, then nodded, its grin comprising most of its face. That seems like a worthwhile trade to me. Its laugh rang out, the brute surely coming up with some kind of dirty trick to pull at the last second. The king and his knights stepped back, and the knoll approached the center of the courtyard. Every warrior around, orc and human alike, began cheering for their champion. Jorg slowly adjusted his stance, keeping his staff in one hand, aiming away from his opponent. In an instant, Jorg bolted at full speed towards the brute, who hadn't hesitated to swing its wicked halberd in a wide horizontal arc, hoping to cut the human down before he could land a blow. But Jorg planted the end of his staff in the ground, bending it like a sapling and vaulting himself up into the air. The knoll's halberd struck the staff, knocking it loose and causing it to launch right up into Jorg's airborne grip. He brought the staff down hard on the great brute, striking the back of its hyena-like head and knocking its heavy form to the ground. The din from the audience got louder, but Jorg wasn't concerned with who was cheering for whom. He knelt on the knoll's back, wrapping one arm around its neck, cutting off its air as it tried desperately to regain its composure. Jorg, feeling his opponent about to fall unconscious, whispered into the knoll's ear, I will hold you to your end of... But an explosion rang through the courtyard, and a large number of orc warriors were crushed under a pile of falling debris as the side of the cathedral erupted in a thunderous blast of flame and magic energy. Many knights and horses were knocked to the ground, and a cloud of dust swept across the courtyard, obscuring vision momentarily. When the dust cleared, a figure was walking out of the hole that was once the cathedral's southern wall, dragging another figure behind it. It was Cathalan, wearing a long, white, embroidered wedding gown, dragging the unconscious form of Luxgrave with one hand and holding the sorcerer's own magic wand outstretched in the other. As everyone stood, stunned at her arrival, she tossed the sorcerer's frail body into the courtyard and then gripped the wand with both hands, snapping it over her knee. I appreciate the aid, my liege, 
she said, curtsying before the ruler as if she wasn't standing in a pile of rubble and surrounded by orcs. But as you can see, I think I sorted it out on my own. Jorg scrambled off of the defeated leader and ran to embrace Catholin. All of the knights began to laugh, and some of the orcs did as well. Then they all realized what had just happened, and some fled and others dropped their weapons and surrendered. In a short while, the entire orc force had been driven out or taken prisoner, and the threat of Luxgrave's fell ceremony was no more. The two adventurers sat against the courtyard wall while the knights secured the castle. He was attempting to force me into marriage, said Kathleen, still wearing the long white gown. And if he had succeeded, he was going to kill me in the name of some ancient unknown god in exchange for dominion over the world of men. Jorg took her hand. He looked into her eyes and smiled. She was the most wonderful person he had ever met, and when she destroyed the cathedral wall, Jorg knew he had never seen a more beautiful sight in his entire life. Kathleen, he said, taking her hand in his. When I heard that you had been kidnapped, I... I felt like the world was about to end. The world was about to end, Jorg. He shook his head. No, I mean... If I lost you, then the world would end. My world. He brushed aside a curly lock that had fallen in front of her face. Please promise me you won't go marrying any evil sorcerers. Kathleen smiled and placed a hand on his cheek. I promise I won't go marrying any evil sorcerers. They locked eyes for some time. She could tell that there was still a nagging thought in his head. Jorg, she said, raising her eyebrows. You didn't think I was going to go through with marrying Luxgrave, did you? N no stammered Jorg. Of course not. I just... The thought of someone else taking your hand. He began to turn away, his face going red. Jorg, my beloved, Kathleen added. You and I both know we promised ourselves to each other last year, remember? His face resembled a beat. Well, yes, of course, I, I remember, but... Since we had been so busy adventuring for so long, I was afraid. Nearby, someone cleared their throat. Jorg and Kathleen turned and saw the king watching the two of them, a smile on his face. Uh, I'm sorry, my liege. Please, let us help. Jorg fumbled. The king held up a hand. I'm afraid I have been eavesdropping, he said. And if the two of you aren't too busy, I thought maybe today was a good day for a wedding after all. The two looked at each other, both unsure of what to do or say, but when they locked eyes, they knew deep down that they wanted to be with each other for the rest of their lives. Kathleen hiked up her wedding gown and hurried out of the courtyard. Not here, she said, pulling Jorg with her. She pointed up to a flowered-covered hill with a single tree that she had seen when she was first brought to the castle. The day had grown late, and just past the hill, the sun was beginning to touch the horizon across the sparkling bay. The two stood atop the hill, holding each other in their arms. The king laid hands on them both and gave them his blessing. When the ceremony was completed with a kiss, the two held hands as husband and wife. An army of knights and a handful of captured orcs applauded. It is said in the royal traditions, began the king, plucking a flower from the ground beneath him, that if a king presents a husband and wife with a flower on their wedding day, then that flower shall grow and bloom for as long as your love reaches across the realms. And with that, he held out the most beautiful flower either of them had ever seen. And I still have that flower to this day, said Jorg, reaching into his vest pocket and holding a beautiful blossom up for his new friend to see. That's very nice, said Geddert, finding it hard to mask the skepticism in his voice. Those flowers grew all over these parts, and in all likelihood, the man had simply plucked it before leaving town. Nobody spoke for a little while. On the floor, Yasmin had begun chewing on a stick. A bit of time passed. Gaddert began to wonder if he had time to catch a quick nap before the caravan stopped again. Say, began Jorg, peeking outside the wagon to survey the surroundings. Are you old enough to remember the spell plague? Gaddert perked up 
but then realized this was probably going to lead to some kind of a story of unknown veracity. Yeah, he finally answered. I was a child, but several of my relatives died to that. It just kind of went away on its own, didn't it? Jorg smiled warmly, another twinkle in his eye. Not quite. For years, the deadly plague had been ravaging the land, first stealing the lives of the weak and poor, but over time, none were safe from its effects. Respite was nowhere to be found, until one day the wisest sages and most powerful diviners learned that it originated deep in the darkest lands of the Nine Hells, crafted by some dark force bent on the destruction of all who draw breath. An antidote seemed impossible to acquire, unless someone was willing to brave the dangers that lurked in the plainer prison where the damned spend eternity. Luckily for everyone, two brave heroes answered the call. Jorg and Kathleen, having resolved themselves to face every horror the multiverse could muster with the stalwart strength of a union unbroken, bid farewell to their king and their land, setting off on a quest that would surely be their last. With a plan reasoned by Kathleen's razor-sharp wit and Jorg as the shield that would protect them both, they journeyed for months into the Nine Hells, first fighting their way through the Gates of the Damned, where a pack of gargantuan fire-breathing hounds guarded the Hellgate from any who come in the name of goodness and virtue, and then through the Nine dark and burning and frozen layers in turn, Avernus, Dis, Minauros, Phlegathos, Stygia, Malbolge, Maladomini, Cania, and the lowest and darkest of them all, Nessus. With each layer, they slew treacherous devils and freed the imprisoned, drawing the ire of each of the archdevils that ruled each layer. Once they had reached Nessus, the bottom of the pit, the realm of Asmodeus, king of the Nine Hells, they turned back and for weeks they backtracked across all nine layers, spreading holy water as they went and chanting prayers to the angels and gods above while avoiding the murderous denizens that lurked behind every corner. As they reached the entrance to the Nine Hells once again and readied their escape, Jorg and Kathleen saw that their plan had worked. The nine rulers of the plain had gathered, cutting them off at the Hellgate, each one capable of slaying the heroes with a flick of their wrist. Asmodeus, holding back the pack of giant hellhounds, called out from amongst his brethren. Give me one reason why I should not condemn you to the vilest torture for all of eternity. Jorg stood in front of Kathleen, wielding his unbreakable staff, but she put a hand on his shoulder and stepped forward. Because I have gathered the nine rulers of hell for a noble purpose, one that shall unite all of the plains in harmony, Lord Asmodeus. With a sneer on his face, the archdevil paused. It had been centuries since more than two or three of them had been on the same layer of hell. Yet whether it was by courage, luck, or foolishness, this mortal had managed to gather all nine. And what noble purpose, said the king of the Nine Hells, could possibly unite paragons of evil with a paladin like yourself, let alone all of the plains? Kathleen stood tall, though Jorg could see that the months of hard journey in this horrible place had taken its toll on her. He held her hand in his for support as she responded to the audience of devils before them. The spell plague, she replied, and her voice was suddenly drowned out by a cacophony of voices laughing and jeering. Balzabal, the slug-like Archduke of Hell, slithered forward, its voice like a bowl of yogurt being poured onto a table. Yes, the spell plague. One of my favorite creations. Asmodeus cast the wretched slug a momentary look of absolute fury, but regained his composure quickly. He turned back towards the pair of mortals. The spell plague is a creation of hell. 
What foolish whim makes you think we would unite against it? Because the material realm is not the only one ravaged by it, Kathleen responded, a fire in her eyes. We have suffered greatly from it, yes, but all planes, good and evil, have suffered losses in numbers too high to count. I have seen that you have three possibilities, lord and lords. First, you can hope that its ravages shall be without end, killing all creatures across every realm. You shall be feared across all time and space, by all until their dying breaths. Balzabal cackled maniacally, slime dripping from its protruding mouth. Yes, the spell plague shall never stop, never recede. Second, continued Kathleen, trying to stand tall, but her face flushing as she did. Someday, somewhere, someone will cure the spell plague. Humanity's greatest strength comes from their persistence and the fact that those in power are bound to underestimate them. And when that day comes, you and your company shall be known as nothing. Below the tiniest worm trod underfoot, all will be taken from you, and you shall never return. Jorg could see the rage building in each of the faces of the archdevils, but their attention still held on the paladin at his side. Or third, she shouted, meeting each of their angered gazes with the righteous fury in hers. You can work together. Work with us. Work with all humanity to be the creators of that cure. Retain your dominion. Retain your reputation as the wielders of power feared by all. Yes, you can kill all of mankind and kill your own as well. But remember this. As we speak, your own subjects are dying. And a ruler with no subjects is a sad ruler indeed. Jorg expected to hear another cacophony of rage or laughter. But none of the archdevils, not even Balzable, who moments ago had taken credit for the plague's very creation broke the silence for some time. Eventually, one of the rulers, a sickly-looking giant, its head radiating a white glow, whom Kathleen recognized as a proxy of Prince Levistus, whom Asmodeus had imprisoned in an iceberg many centuries ago, stepped forward, speaking with a low, gravelly voice. It is true. We have lost many and we'll lose more whether we wish it or not. I ask you, tell us your plan to put the spell plague to its end. Two mortals, armed only with their wits and the hopes and prayers of all mankind, spoke to a company of archdevils about how to save the multiverse as equals. After the plan had been detailed, and all nine rulers understood their roles and began to set off to do their part, Jorg called to the king of the nine hells. The terrible devil deigned to look down at the dwarfish human who called for him, his eyes narrowing. Lord Asmodeus, I ask of you, what promise do we have that you and your kin will not turn on us the moment our guard is down? Kathleen grabbed his arm, nervous at this brazen challenge of the archdevil. Before we leave, continued Jorg, I ask that you give us a token of the covenant we have made this day. The lord of the pit shot a fiery stare at the bold warrior, but rather than smite him where he stood, Asmodeus turned towards the pack of vicious hellhounds that guarded the hellgate. Reaching between them as they gnashed their teeth, he plucked something small and placed it on the ground before Jorg. Very well, a token of our covenant, spoke the archdevil, who then vanished in a flash of toothy darkness. In front of the two heroes was a tiny pup who began rubbing its ginger hair against Kathleen's leg.
And so it is that the spell plague found its cure, said Jorg, looking outside to once again survey the surroundings. Despite himself, Gettert was surprised by the sudden end of the story. He didn't know if he believed, well, any of it, but he had enjoyed listening regardless. That was quite interesting, he began, but saw that Jorg was gathering up his things and pulling on his pack. You're leaving? The old man nodded. We're almost at my stop. I've got a date to meet, and hopefully she'll still be waiting. He smiled, nodded to his new companion, and called for Yasmin to follow him. The dog dropped the stick it had been chewing on, which had somehow turned black from charring, and followed. Gettert waved goodbye, feeling strangely puzzled by the man. As the caravan continued on its way, Jorg and Yasmin walked away from the road for a while, until they reached a familiar hill visible in front of the setting sun. As they climbed the hill, off in the distance, an old crumbling castle was visible, its largest building having mostly collapsed into the courtyard and its once brilliant spires lost to time or thieves. At the top of the hill, Jorg saw the sun reach the horizon across a sparkling bay, and right in front of him, amidst a bed of beautiful flowers and next to a lone tree, a stone marker indicated the grave. Hello, Kathleen, he said, the twinkle returning to his eyes. I'm sorry I'm later than I meant to be, but I got here before sunset at least. Jorg reached into his pack, pushed aside a large dragon fang, and pulled out a small blanket and sat down on it. He then pulled out a small portrait, showing a curly-haired woman, and propped it against the grave marker. Yasmin sniffed around, then found a comfortable spot to lie. She sneezed, and a tiny puff of smoke came out. Jorg took a deep breath, staring out over the bay. I miss you, he said. I really do. It's... it's hard, getting by. The king is reaching his twilight years, and there are times when he doesn't recognize me. I'll admit I haven't asked him about you in some time out of fear that he's forgotten. I don't know if I have the heart to take that right now. He wiped his eye and stared at the setting sun for a while. In the last few minutes of sunset, he gazed deeply into the portrait. She looked as beautiful as on their wedding day, as beautiful as she was in his memory, as beautiful as she would ever be. Looking in the bag, he fished out a bottle of wine, some sandwiches, and two glasses. He ate a sandwich and handed some to Yasmin as well. He poured some wine into each glass and set one down in front of the grave. As the sun finally dipped below the horizon, he raised his glass and tapped it gently against the other. To us, he toasted, and times we've had. And Jorg watched the sunset with his wife. And so that was the dinner date. Uh, let me give you a little bit of backstory on this. Most of the stories that I write are inspired by D&D uh, &D characters I've played or NPCs and campaigns I've played in. Um, I also have several stories on our Patreon that were about characters that our patrons actually submitted to me. One of the perks of our top tier of our Patreon is that you can uh, send me a character that you played, send me details and bio and so on, and I will write a story about your character. Uh, but this story is actually, it's its none of those. This is actually something even more personal. Um, I wrote this story in November 2018. So as of this recording just a few months ago. Um, but I had the idea for this story on my mother's birthday. Uh, she passed away about four years ago. And I haven't really talked much about my family on the show. Aside from, you know, having my brother as a, uh, I interviewed my brother Tim 
on here a long time ago, but uh, my mom was a doctor for many years and throughout her whole life, she just really wanted to help people. Um, a lot of people think of doctors when they think of doctors, they think of like the rich surgeons that, you know, they talk to a patient for five minutes and then they go play golf or whatever. But uh, my mom really wasn't any of that. She catered specifically to the poor, the downtrodden. She actually spent years building a low income health clinic in downtown Detroit specifically to help people who had nowhere else to go because they didn't have insurance and they didn't have money to be seen elsewhere. Uh, to an extent, I really feel like my mom is kind of the paragon of what a lawful good paladin should be, willing to help people even when it puts their own health and finances at in jeopardy. Anyway, um, this past year when her birthday came around, I was thinking about her, I was thinking about my dad, and, you know, my dad who, he, you know, he's still with me, of course, I, I see him every now and then, he spent his entire life with this person that he loved and... That person is just gone. And, you know, I always wonder what that time of year must be like for him. But the guys in my family don't exactly uh, talk about emotions and such. So, you know, I guess I've never talked to him about that, nor do I really (laughs) intend to. Um, Anyway, a lot of the stories I write are things that I want to write. But when my mom's birthday came around and the idea of this story came to me, um, I don't know. It, it wasn't something I wanted to write. I just I felt like it was something that I had to write, you know. So in case I didn't make it clear, uh, the main characters of the story are loosely based, let's say, upon uh, my parents. Uh, Jorg and Kathleen were based on my parents, uh, George and Kathleen. Uh, not that, you know, either of them were, you know, adventurers that went around the world and fought monsters or anything like that. Uh, in fact, when I was a little kid, I used to joke that my dad was a ninja because he was so boring that surely there must be more to him than meets the eye. But I, I don't know. I just I wanted to write something that showed my parents as the the people that I'm sure they wanted to be. They strove to be. So anyway, um. I decided a month or two ago that I wanted to do another Garg and Moon Slicer type episode, and this story definitely stood out as one that I I just really loved, and I wanted to get out there for more people to experience. So uh, I really hope you like this one, and hey, if it wasn't your thing, I understand. I guess join us next week. We'll be back to our usual goofs and cleverly hidden red dragons and so on, but uh, thanks for listening. Thank you for spreading word about the show, and I... Hope you all have a wonderful week. Thanks.